So we've been we've been discussing uh, the, the vessels that we've made it through uh, the arteries and look at the different layers of the artery. Uh, and I really I want to take just a quick moment to deviate this a little bit and talk actually a little bit about a disease process that affects uh, hearts. Uh, I'm sorry, arteries. Arteries. And the reason I'm going to do this is because um, it's becoming more and more prevalent in the disease condition that, that annually is uh, responsible for up to 25,000 deaths every year. And it's really specifically related to the structure and design of the of the arteries coupled with the decisions that we make. Um, um, behavioral decisions and things like that. And the, the injury concern is aneurysm. And aneurysm can occur in a variety of different vessels. In particular, aneurysm occurs in two locations along what's called the uh, descending aorta. So this is um, the portion of the aorta that, that comes down towards the lower, uh, lower extremities and towards the, the lower portions of the body. And we really have two different uh, parts of the aorta. We have that that's in the thoracic cavity, which we call the thoracic aorta. And then we have the aorta that's down here in the abdomen, and we call that the abdominal aorta. Now, I said that this is an injury concern because we're increasing the number of cases annually, and it's based off of the decisions that we make. So the inner lining, um, the endothelial lining of the arteries, those endothelial cells, they can actually experience damage. And one of the biggest culprits that cause that damage is high blood pressure. And high blood pressure is considered the standard <coughs> killer because the injury that occurs with high blood pressure, we really don't have any recollection or feeling that we have high blood pressure. We only know that we have high blood pressure if it's measured. So you go to the doctor, every time you go to the doctor, they should be measuring your blood pressure. Just to keep track of the blood pressure, because that's really the only way you're going to really know if you have elevated blood pressure. Now, assuming that that's not really, really high, if it gets super high, you start to have some awkward symptoms. But normally, high blood pressure, 140s, 150s, you really don't, don't know that you have the, the high blood pressure unless it's measured. So we call it the silent killer because you have the damage occurring, but you don't know that the damage is occurring unless it's measured. So what happens with the high blood pressure is it pushes on those endothelial cells, and we end up with opening in the tissue. So we end up with opening in the tissue, and as the tissue opens up, what happens is blood begins to leak out from the endothelial tissue into the lower layers. So it sort of it sort of is is uh, going to cause internal bleeding, but it's bleeding that gets trapped inside of the tissue of the artery. So the blood tissue gets trapped, and, and at this point, this is what we're actually going to call an aneurysm. And as more and more blood is trapped out here in places like the aorta, can happen in uh, other arteries as well. Um, but the blood gets trapped, and you begin to have sort of this ballooning effect that occurs as more and more blood is trapped. Now, as that ballooning occurs on the outside, it's actually occurring on the inside as well. So it's not just that it's going outward, it's actually going inward as well. And as we go inward, we begin to see, so this is our vessel, we begin to trap blood on the outside, we begin to trap blood on the inside, and as you can see, we begin to reduce the diameter of that lumen or that opening. And I'm going to refer to that as occlusion. So we can say we occlude or begin to occlude the lumen. 
Now, as I occlude the lumen of the artery, this reduces blood flow through that space. So now we've reduced blood flow. Uh, so we're beginning to compromise our ability to perfuse our tissues, which is problematic. But in addition, that that ballooning of the of the walls of the of the artery begins to weaken the artery. And eventually the artery is going to rupture. As it weakens and collects more blood, it gets bigger and bigger, more ballooning. It's weaker and weaker, and then it ruptures. Now, when it happens in the aorta, the aorta is not that far away from the heart. If we open up the aorta, blood just pours out of the circulatory system. So we end up with very severe internal bleeding. And that very severe <laughs> internal bleeding, you lose enough blood, and it's not recoverable. It doesn't matter if they give you additional blood and repair the whole. If you lose enough blood in a given amount of time, it's totally irreversible. There's no way for that individual to survive. Um, down here in the abdominal aorta, when you have an abdominal aortic aneurysm, that's called the triple A. The triple A is the middle. You basically don't survive if you have a triple A. So it's pretty serious. And again, it happens with high blood pressure which many of you may not have high blood pressure now, some of you probably do, but you're all probably going to have elevated blood pressure <laughs> as you get older, unless you take um, precautionary steps such as uh, exercise and, and proper dietary habits. So don't be lazy. So moving on, um, we, we've discussed the arteries. Arteries lead into capillaries. Capillaries are referred to as the local blood flow. Local blood flow just simply means that it's the blood that's circulating within the tissue to provide the tissue the nutrient, nutrients and the oxygen that's required, and also to remove the waste products. So we call that basically perfusion of the tissue. And I'm going to use the capillaries as an example of how we're going to regulate blood flow through certain tissue. Right now, you're not really using any of your cells. Hopefully, you're using your brains. So it's going to be better if we supply more nutrients and oxygen to the medical to support the metabolism of the brain as you're thinking and writing notes and things like that than to supply blood to your muscles. You can get up here and you leave and start walking down, you're going to need to increase blood flow to the muscles. So how do we actually go through that process where we can shift where blood is being distributed and what tissues are receiving that? And really that is the responsibility of our capillaries. So the arteries are just simply the conduit that carries blood and that uh, arteries or th th those arteries rather are going to connect to capillaries. And those capillaries are going to form into what's called a capillary bed. So think of this as being uh, a network of really small vessels intertwined within cells of some tissue. So you have the artery coming in, and blood gets shunted away from the artery and circulates through this thing called a capillary bed. Now, <clears throat> as you can see at the kind of uh, entrance into the capillary bed, I have these small little vessels that lead into the capillary. We call those the uh, the through um, the through vessels or the met arterioles. Each of the met arterioles on the uh, arterial side or on the artery side of the circulation, they have little tiny smooth muscles. And those smooth muscles can contract and squeeze on that vessel to reduce the diameter of that vessel. So at that junction point with the arterial side of the circulation, we'll have those precapillary sphincters. And a sphincter is a smooth muscle that is going to be able to respond to a stimuli 
to regulate the size of the tube. And it's not just necessarily in the circulatory system. We see sphincters and a variety of other tube systems, digestive, urinary, female, female reproductive systems as well. So this sphincter is just simply a smooth, smooth muscle ring. And that smooth muscle ring contracts and relaxes. And as it contracts and relaxes, it's regulating the overall diameter of the, of the lumen. lumen. So how big is that? How big is that? Uh, is that opening through through the particular vessel that we're discussing? Now, when I contract or am signaled to contract a precapillary sphincter, that contraction leads towards a process called vasoconstriction. Now, vasoconstriction is going to reduce the diameter of the lumen. Okay, so we're decreasing the diameter of that opening, which is going to decrease blood flow. decrease tissue blood flow when we contract that precapillary sphincter. What if I relax the precapillary sphincter? Relaxation is going to cause the opposite of vasoconstriction, which is vasodilation. And vasodilation is just simply going to be an increase in size of the lumen resulting in the increase in tissue blood flow. All right, so let's see if we kind of have an idea of what's going on here. Okay, so you all stand up and you leave. And as you're leaving, um, you start to walk up and down the stairs. This increases workload for <coughs> your muscles. What will happen to the vaso, I'm sorry, what will happen to the uh, precapillary sphincters uh, leading into the uh, cells or the capillary events associated with muscles? Yeah, we're going to increase blood flow, so we're going to cause those precapillary sphincters to do what? Vasoconstrict or vasodilate? They're going to vasodilate. What about, uh, let's say, you um, are moving around. Um, we don't need to produce urine as much. So what's going to happen to the precapillary sphincters in the kidney? They're going to go through vasoconstriction because I'm going to reduce circulation through the kidneys because I don't need to produce urine when I'm up moving around. All right, so just a little bit more here on um, the actual capillaries themselves. Uh, again, they form beds, uh, so this whole thing would be a capillary bed, and what you would see in here are individual <coughs> cells, and each individual cell in the human body is within one to two cells of a capillary. Okay, there are some tissues where every single cell has its own little section of capillary. There are some where you may have a capillary and a single cell that's right up next to that capillary and another cell that's a little bit further away, and then another capillary over here. There are some where every single cell is going to have its own capillary. Okay? Those capillaries are required because they act as the main interface with that solution and the cells themselves. So the solution surrounding the cell is called the extracellular fluid. So this is the way that we move nutrients into the cell, the way we get rid of waste products out of the cell. Again, the term bed or capillary bed just simply is referring to a network of capillaries. 
And an individual capillary bed is actually going to service a relatively small area of tissue. So it's not like you have a single muscle that has one capillary bed running through it. You're going to have small little parts of that, of that muscle that are serviced by small individual capillary beds. So you'll have thousands of individual capillary beds throughout a tissue like a, a muscle. Now, the capillary wall uh, of these capillaries put together in a capillary bed, it's basically a, a single layer of endothelial cells, which we've already seen endothelial cells. They were the first layer, the inner layer of the arteries. We now just have a single layer of those endothelial cells. And that single layer of endothelial cells no additional layers on top of this. We don't see the muscle layer or the connective tissue layer. We just have a single layer of cells here. And what we're going to find in this capillary wall, these individual endothelial cells, <coughs> is there's actually going to be spaces in between the cells. There also could be, in some circumstances, pores directly through the cell. And so really what I'm saying here is it's not a really, really tight packed cells right up next to each other. It does not look like that. It looks more like this, where there are spaces between the cells. And the blood would be on one side, and the extracellular fluid in the cells that we're trying to service are going to be on the other side. So we actually can have material from the blood transmitted through those small openings into the extracellular fluid. Now, it's not everything. It's not really big stuff, so like the red blood cells aren't going to pass through. They're, they're too big to cross through those small little openings. But molecules of oxygen, which are really small compared to a whole size cell, oxygen will permeate right through the, these openings. <laughs> so these openings exist in the capillaries to allow exchange of molecules. <clears throat> and primarily what drives the exchange of molecules is going to be pressure. And when I say pressure, I'm not talking about the pressure that's derived by the heart. So the heart contracts, it squeezes on the blood, creates pressure, and moves the blood. I'm actually talking about pressure that's inherent to the two different fluids that we're exchanging between. So there is pressure in the blood, just because the blood is a water-based environment. It's a liquid environment, and that liquid has a characteristic pressure. The extracellular fluid is also a water-based environment and has a characteristic pressure. So the, the movement of these molecules, these solutes from the blood to the tissue or from the tissue back to the blood is going to be driven by this inherent pressure that we find inside of, uh, inside of the solutions. The exchange that occurs for molecules, uh, or for molecules crossing from blood into the tissue or tissue back into the blood is called filtration. And so we're going to have these pressures that drives filtration. So when we look at what actually crosses into the extracellular fluid from the blood. And this is going to occur primarily on the arterial side of the capillary. So as the blood comes out of the artery into the capillary, that's where we have exchange occurring. Now, remember that the more water that you have inside of the container, the more pressure that water exerts. So we begin to lose molecules and plasma. Those molecules also exert a pressure. 
So as we're losing the water in those other molecules in the plasma, we're changing as the blood flows through the tube, we're changing the pressures that are exerted. So on the arterial side, there's enough pressure or to drive filtration of molecules and plasma into the tissue. On the other side, we've changed it enough where we're actually going to drive plasma water molecules back out, right? So molecules and plasma filtrate through. Most um, of the cells and the proteins are going to be kept inside of the blood because they're too big to cross through the openings. So it's molecules in the plasma minus cells and in a lot of the proteins that will enter our extracellular fluid. And the molecules that are of the utmost importance in this process are going to include things like oxygen, nutrients, which a big one for us is going to be glucose, which helps to um, uh, helps to maintain our energetics in the cell, maintain the, the behavior of the cell, and then other raw nutrients, uh, amino acids, uh, components of uh, protein. Uh, or the nucleic acids, which are components of DNA and RNA. So we're going to get those individual molecules <coughs> passed into the tissue as what I'm going to call raw materials, building blocks to be able to produce those larger molecules of proteins and DNA and RNA. On the opposite side, we're actually going to pick up our waste molecules, metabolic waste, including carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide and waste are going to enter the fluid on the venal side, on the venous side of the capillary. Now, the thing that's most interesting about this is you have water, and water is shown right here, and it's shown right here. So water enters in on one side, and then water leaves on the other side. So basically, you have this cycle of water where water flows in, circulates through, and comes back out. However, because of the pressure differences, we actually have more water that, that enters than water that leaves. So this provides us a little bit of a problem. I have more water here than I take back. <coughs> so I'm slowly accumulating more and more water. And that's not really that good of a thing. It's called edema, and it will make your skin look really, really puffy. And you maybe have had a small amount of edema before you spend your day on your feet. You get home and you lift your feet like can of people. You've accumulated excess of fluid in the cells of the muscle and other parts of the of the tissue that are in, in your feet. And then you sit down and you're <coughs> Lay back in your lazy boy in paper, and an hour later, you've actually seen drainage and your foot is not looking as puffy as it had before. And it's because that excess of water has been picked up. Now, that's not the way that it really works all of the time. That's if you have a really large excessive amount of water that builds up and makes some of the puffiness. Normally, that extra water that's in there, we're actually going to pull it out through a different mechanism, and we'll talk about that in just a second here. So slightly more water is going to enter the extracellular fluid than what is reabsorbed. Slightly more filter is in, slightly less is reabsorbed. And if you look at the volume of water in both compartments, both in the plasma and in the extracellular fluid, you're going to have an increase in the extracellular fluid volume. It's getting trapped in the tissue. And we're actually going to see a decrease in the plasma volume. So you're slowly dehydrating your blood. So this is a little bit of a problem because I don't want my tissues to blow up and I definitely don't want to lose a large amount of water from my blood. I want to keep this regulated. I want to remove the excess of volume from the extracellular fluid and I want to put it back into uh, the plasma. And we actually get that 
from our lymphatic system. You'll remember that we have lymphatic capillaries that are in the midst here. These are also found inside of the tissue beds, um, inside of the capillary, associated with the capillary bed. And so as more water accumulates inside of the tissue, the lymphatic vessels are going to regulate that volume issue. So we end up here with uh, lymphatic exchange that can occur. So the lymphatic capillaries, which are associated with the blood capillaries, they are actually going to have <coughs> bigger spaces between their endothelial cells. So the, the space between the, the capillaries in the blood is relatively small, only allows very small amounts of material to cross. The lymphatic capillaries have larger space between their endothelial cells, so more material and a larger amount of that material can, can actually cross. And that uh, under normal circumstances, the excessive extracellular fluid begins to accumulate. And that accumulation is going to be picked up, that excessive accumulation is picked up by the capillaries. Now this is actually a good thing because as we're picking up that excessive water, the lymphatics can actually pick up additional material as well. And it's going to be larger materials. So we pick up the excess of water from the extracellular fluid, and within that water, we're going to have larger molecules. So things like lipids and proteins, even some cells, can be picked up by the lymphatics. And they'll be circulated back, as we learned um, when we were talking about the lymphatic system, back to the subclavian vein after it goes through the lymph nodes and plants, and it gets dumped back into the blood. And so we recover that excessive extracellular fluid content, that excessive water being dumped into the extracellular fluid. Now, how many of you have ever heard of a condition called elephantiasis? Have you ever Googled? <laughs> so basically, elephantiasis, you have people who get, especially in the lower extremities, including the reproductive system, accumulation of excessive fluid, and their legs look like a big elephant's leg. Everybody now know what I'm talking about. So you get all this excessive accumulation. The reason that elephantiasis occurs is because it's a parasitic worm that actually blocks the lymphatic drainage. And so it plugs up the lymphatic system, and so you don't get the successive uh, the removal of the excessive extracellular fluid from that tissue. And so basically you can identify where that the lymphatic, where the worm is, because below that point you're going to have excessive accumulation and you get large amounts of material and, and uh, fluid that builds up in the tissue, and the tissue just ex expands up. <laughs> the parasite, um, they can treat it with drugs, and it's totally uncommon here in the United States, because one, we're not exposed to those types of parasites very frequently, and if we are, we have access to the drugs. But third world countries, they don't have the same access. We're talking about people that can be hundreds and thousands of miles away from their home care. And this is where it ends up showing up in, in larger homes and these um, sort of patients' population that don't have the same access to, to the medical care that we would have. But yeah, you can just usually give a drug and it kills the parasite and immediately we can get the drain of the body. But of course, it's not as well as All right, so as we leave the capillary bed, blood's drained into the veins. And you'll remember that our definition for a vein is it's a vessel that transports blood to the heart. Again, here uh, with the, the veins, as we leave from the capillaries, we begin to see additional layers of tissue 
and veins are going to have three layers of tissue that surround each of the vessels. They actually are very similar to the, to the tissues that we see, um, the tissue layers we see with the arteries. So you'll remember that we had the endothelial layer on the very inside, then we had the muscle layer, and then we had that connective tissue layer. The three layers are the same. It's the endothelial layer, then the muscle layer, then the connective tissue. However, the difference is that these layers, these three different layers, are actually going to be thinner, especially the two outer layers. Now, the reason that we can have and we can get away with the, the thinner layers is we're dealing with a much lower pressure. By the time the blood circulates back out of the capillary, pressures are actually pretty much zero. They're very close to being zero. So we have some very low pressure vessels here. This figure that you're looking at basically shows you the pressures inside of the circulatory system from the heart all the way down to the other side, which is going to be, uh, I'm sorry, from the aorta leaving the heart to the vena cava coming back into the heart. And what you can see is as we move away from the heart, we get the change in, in pressure as the heart beats, and eventually we get into the capillaries and leading into the capillaries, and it diminishes to very little <coughs> pressure at all. So blood pressure in the vena cava coming back into the heart is almost zero. Now, there is a little bit of a problem here, because remember, pressure, pressure is what we use to move a fluid. I put high pressure over here, and I put low pressure over here, and fluid's going to move from high to low. This is really very, very low pressure. We have an additional force, and it's called gravity, that's going to be pulling all of the blood in the venous system towards the center of the earth, right? So basically towards your feet. So how do I ever get blood back up here to the heart standing in an erect position? In other words, we must overcome the effects of gravity. And this idea of circulating blood back to the heart, fighting against the effects of gravity is called venous return. And there are a couple different mechanisms that facilitate venous return. Okay, so how do we actually move blood back up to the heart when we have a low pressure system and we have to contend with the effects of gravity. All of our vessels are closely associated with muscle. In fact, many of our veins go right through muscle. You'll remember back to our discussion on skeletal muscle that we have this underlying contraction called muscle tone. So your muscles are constantly contracting, even though we don't really know that. They're constantly contracting, and as they contract, those muscles are pushing on the sides of the veins. So they're actually inducing some pressure because of the inward force for the muscles. So the, the contracting skeletal muscle, we're going to call that the muscle pump. So we have this pumping mechanism due to the contraction of skeletal muscle. I actually have a figure here to illustrate what that looks like. So you have this guy flexing his bicep, and as he flexes his bicep, he pushes down on the vessel. And so you get a concentrated area of increased pressure because of that muscle push, and that's going to force blood to begin to move because it's inducing change in pressure. Everybody good. 
Now that's not really enough, but at least now we can create these localized areas of uh, high pressure with our muscles. The second mechanism, and you can actually see it in this figure here, and I'm going to show you another picture as well. The endothelium inside of the of the veins, they create these flaps that create what are called one-way valves. And the one-way valve works as blood passes through the one-way valve in the right direction, which means towards the heart, it closes and it prevents backflow. So you have the muscle pump that creates that localized area of high pressure, squeezes the blood, and as the blood pushes up towards the heart, it goes past the venous valve, and then as it comes back down, that venous valve closes. And so it's kind of a two steps forward, no steps back kind of uh, progression here as we move the blood back up towards uh, back up towards the heart. So the blood is permitted to flow in one direction, and the backflow causes that valve to close to prevent backward flow of blood. So just a slightly better picture here what this looks like. The muscle pump pumps the blood in one direction, and then as the muscle pump subsides, the blood would begin to be affected by gravity to flow back, and that valve just shuts, closes up, and prevents that back flow. There's one more mechanism here that's going to help out with uh, the process of moving blood back to the heart or venous return. And it's actually related to more breathing. All right, so someone remind me real quick, when I breathe, so I expand my thoracic cavity, I increase thoracic volume, what happens to thoracic pressure? It decreases. Inside of the thoracic cavity, the lungs are what we were talking about originally, but it actually affects the heart as well. So as we increase thoracic volume, we also decrease the pressure around the heart. And so with that drop in pressure around the heart, and in particular, the pressure around the vessels that lead into the heart, the superior and inferior vena cava, we actually can induce uh, a state that favors the movement of blood from a uh, place of localized high pressure because of the muscle, skeletal muscle pump, to that lower induced pressure because of the breathing motion. So every time you take a breath and you expand the thoracic cavity, the heart in the thoracic cavity is going to experience lower pressure, especially around those veins leading into the heart. Now, when I breathe and open up the thoracic cavity, what happens to the abdomen? So take a big deep breath in. You'll notice that thoracic cavity expands, but my abdominal cavity is actually going to contract. So I decrease pressure up here, but I increase pressure down here, and I create a pressure gradient that favors the movement of blood from these lower vessels back up towards the heart, towards the vessels uh, by the heart. <coughs> so the abdominal cavity is going to experience contraction. That's an increase in pressure. And it puts higher pressure on those veins that are further from the heart. And it creates a pressure gradient that will favor fluid movement towards those veins at the heart, away from the veins in the abdominal cavity. All right, so we've discussed the blood, 
and we've discussed the vasculature. There's one more tissue that we need to discuss, and that's going to be the heart. And that's where I'm going to pick up now. Heart's a pretty amazing organ. Uh, it is a four chambered, two sided pump. So it is the pump of the circulatory system. And if you think about your heart, hopefully most of you are going to live a long, healthy life. And your heart is going to have to have consistent performance for hopefully 80 or more years. Hopefully you've had pretty consistent performance now for the first 20 years of your life, and hopefully you'll have pretty consistent performance for the next 60 years of your life. So this is a pump. Now, we see pumps in a variety of other mechanical devices as well. You have several that are in your car, in the engine of your car. You have an oil pump, you have a water pump, you have a power steering fluid pump, you have all of these pumps. Those pumps typically break down within about 10 to 15 years, and either you're buying a new vehicle or you're replacing the pump. This pump has to last 80 years and hopefully is never going to be replaced, which is pretty amazing. We actually can outdo all of the pumps that have been designed and optimized by automotive engineers. We can outdo that with the pump that's our heart. So that means in a given lifespan, you're going to see the heart beat 2.8 to 3 billion times. Two point eight to three billion pumps, which is a massive number, a huge number of times that it has to be contracted and it has to pump. So this is a really amazing organ. So let's take a look at the heart. Um, this is a figure that basically illustrates the heart within the thoracic cavity. Now, most of you, if I were to ask. Where is the heart located? Is it located on the left or on the right? Most of you probably are going to say the left. And I'm giving you a trick question because it's not located on the right or the left. It's actually right in the middle. It's right underneath the sternum in the middle of the chest. But it's rotated just slightly. And so there's this thing called the long axis of the heart that's not perfectly vertical with the long axis of the body. It's at an angle. And so the heart sets at that angle, that long axis of the angle, and the ventricles, which are large, um, large amounts of muscle tissue, extend beyond the sternum. And so you can put your hand on your heart, and you can actually feel the heart work because the ventricles are massive mechanical devices that vibrate when they work. So the heart's right in the center, but it's rotated. So you end up with about two thirds of the heart extending out uh, towards the left portion, to a third of it's extending out towards the, the, the right side of the body. Uh, the base of the heart is actually up at the top, and it's called the base because it's the bigger portion. And then the apex is at the bottom where it forms its peak. The heart itself is going to actually be contained in a sac. So the heart tissue is put inside of a um, fibrous sac. That fibrous sac is called the pericardium. You can see it illustrated here. Now this pericardium is actually going to have two different layers. You're going to have sort of this outer layer made up of what's called the fibrous pericardium and the parietal pericardium. And then you have an inner layer that's associated with the heart itself called the visceral pericardium. In between those two layers, you have this space. Now, under normal physiological circumstances, that space really doesn't exist. It's kind of like putting two Walmart bags together. You can put them together, and you know that there's a space in there, but really you can't 
you can't observe that space because it's it's sealed up so tightly together. So we call it a potential space. It's a cavity that's beyond a normal physiological circumstances uh, non-existent. So it has the potential to be a cavity, but normally it does not have. Um, it's normally not in, uh, on a cavity. But that pericardial cavity becomes very important. So the space in between the two layers of the pericardium. Inside of that space, we have a lubricant. It's called pericardial fluid. And that pericardial fluid reduces friction. Remember, we're dealing with a pump here, and it's going to pump 3 billion times in your life. And we don't want it to be like rubbing our hands together. If you rub your hands together long enough, just like this, eventually they, they heat it up because of the friction. It becomes really, really painful. Uh, heart's going to be at rest 60 to 70 beats every minute, so 60 to 75 times a minute. If you just start rubbing your hands together at about 60 to 75 times in a minute, if you do that for about 5 or 10 minutes, you're going to be pretty uncomfortable. So we actually need to protect the heart. So we have this pericardial fluid that lubricates uh, this space inside of the heart. So every time the heart pumps and it kind of rubs up against other tissue, it's actually protected by this by this lubricant. And it allows smooth operation. We actually saw something very similar, right, with the lungs. The lungs were also encased in the pleural um, membrane and uh, allowed for smooth operation. And if we have something um, that gets trapped inside of that pericardial fluid air or uh, a liquid, a solution that has a, a higher viscosity, it becomes painful. The heart um, doesn't operate smoothly, and it becomes very, very painful. So very important to regulate the normal function of the heart. All right, we look at the inside of the heart. If we take a cross section through the heart, what we're going to find is there's four different chambers. See those four chambers here. These are basically open containers inside of the heart. And these four chambers are going to work together to regulate blood flow. And we need to regulate blood flow through the heart, out to the lungs, and out to the rest of the uh, out to the rest of the tissue. And it's going to be these four different chambers that help to distribute blood into those what we call um, circulatory circuits. So if I divide the heart up into a top half and a left and a right half, we can begin to name these chambers. If we just start here with the top of the heart, the chambers at the top of the heart, up here towards the base, are called atria. Now, atria is the plural. So your heart has two atria. Singularly, it's going to be atria. So your heart has one right atria. On the bottom of the heart, we're going to have two larger chambers. And these are going to be the ventricles. Ventricle would be singular. These are very muscular chambers. And what I mean by muscular chambers is if you look at the amount of muscle tissue that surrounds each of these chambers, it's much thicker than the muscle tissue that surrounds the atria. The atria are very thin uh, muscle tissue. This is a very thick muscle tissue. In the middle between both, well really between both the ventricles and also the atria, hidden here behind the, uh, the vessels we have here, you have this muscle tissue in the middle, and that's called a septum. And a septum is not specific to the heart. 
This part of your nose that separates the nostrils is also called the septum. That's just a piece of tissue that separates two different cavities. So you're going to have an interventricular septum, which separates the ventricles, and an interatrial septum that separates the two atria. Next time, we'll pick up with blood flow through the heart, and we'll track blood flow as it moves through the heart.